18. Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 18, the Bible reads, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. I'm going to be preaching this evening on the subject of wives obeying their husbands. Wives obeying their husbands. So, throughout the evening series, we've been going through legitimate authorities that God has established. This is a highly requested sermon from the Mint. No, I'm just kidding. This, this, uh, we, this is going to be one of the, uh, also one of the other legitimate authorities that God has set into place. God has instituted the family. God set up the family and with any institution, if it's it is going to be successful, if there are motives, if there are goals, if there are you know, certain things that are uh, trying to be achieved, there has to be leadership. So God sets someone into place to be the leader. And the Bible is very clear that that is the husband. Now last week I preached on the subject of children obeying their parents. These two sermons are of the utmost importance today, modern day. There is a, a serious, fierce attack on the families. There is an agenda to tear apart a true, legitimate family, a biblical family with biblical values and principal values. You, you see this coming from every single angle. So we need to tighten up on these things. This may be something you feel like, oh, I know this. You know, this is, you know, this is a basic thing that I've heard preached many times. You need to pay attention and you need to think about the things that are being preached. You need to make sure that you're putting these things into practice because oftentimes when people start to slip in an area, they're unaware of it. They don't realize that, hey, I'm not exactly where I used to be until someone points it out, until they read something. Then they realize, like, you know what? I'm lacking now in this area. I've changed in this area. Oftentimes when people change, they don't realize they've changed. And not only that, maybe there's something you haven't realized in the Bible. Maybe there's something that you have noticed that, hey, I haven't been doing this. This is something that I haven't in my life been doing in my family. Uh, so tonight I'm going to be preaching about wives obeying their husbands. Wives obeying their husbands. Now many times we've been in Colossians chapter number 3 and Ephesians chapter number 5. These are parallel passages in many ways. It talks about singing hymns and bows. But it also has a big section of different legitimate authorities that need to be obeyed. And uh, we've seen the children being referenced in this passage, children obeying their parents. We also saw servants obeying their masters. And then here again we see the wives obeying their husbands. Wives obeying their husbands. So the statement that we find here is this. Look at verse number 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. And then it goes on to say this. As it is fit in the Lord. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. We get a little bit more information in Ephesians chapter number 5. <clears throat> So it uses there the word submit. I'm going to give you the, the dictionary definition. This is modern day dictionary, of course. The dictionary definition of the word submit. It says this, submit, accept or yield to a superior force or to the authority or will of another person. You know, a synonym of that would be to obey, of course. It would be to obey. I'm going to give you an example here. This is the first time the word submit is used in the King James Bible. Genesis chapter number 16, verse number 9 it says this, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. Now, of course, that's with Hagar and with Sarai, right? It's Sarah. And she is told to return to her mistress. And mistress is another name for a woman that has a servant, right? You know, uh, like mister, the word mister, our modern day word mister comes from master. Uh, I don't know if you've known that. But our modern day mister, word mister comes from master and the word mistress is also a word that's basically saying like mistress, if you will, like a master over a servant. And that's what it means, mistress. Return and submit yourself unto your mistress. Sarai was her master, who, what, a woman, obviously, and she was being told to submit. So we can get an idea and the connotation that this carries when we see the very first time that the word submit is used. It is used about a servant or a woman that is in labor or work, indentured servitude, if you will, to another person. I mean, you can see that it, it carries a serious meaning of obedience. It means to obey. That is what the word submit meant, means. Obviously, the sub means to be under. It means that you are you know, under this person in the sense of authority, that you are to obey them and do what they tell you to do. They are to be your boss. So look at Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5, we're going to look at verse number 22. Verse number 22, it says this, Wives, 
submitting yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, if you noticed in Colossians 3, it says as fit in the Lord, right? Well, you get a little bit more idea of what that means here. It tells you as unto the Lord. Now, that is, of course, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, we get an idea of what it actually means and what level of obedience that a woman should have or a wife specifically should have to her husband. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Oftentimes, there are a lot of Christian women there. Most churches nowadays, besides fundamental Baptists, do not teach that women should submit to their husbands. It is considered, you know, uh, uh, misogynistic. It is considered that you are a woman hater. You're oppressing women. You hate women. If you believe that women should submit to their husbands. I'm here to tell you that that's what the Bible teaches. And I don't care if it bothers you. I don't care who gets offended. I don't care who walked in this door. I would preach this message just the same and you should feel the exact same way. That whatever the Bible says, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. They are so screwed up in every area of life. They give the worst advice. Their relationships and the husband and wife are constantly getting divorced. They're the last people that I want them to try to give me marital advice and how I should run my relationship in the home. The Bible teaches that women should submit to their husbands, that wives should submit to their husbands. Now, I'm going to get into, of course, it doesn't mean that they're of lesser value. And I'm going to get into that in a moment, the difference between those two things and how those are not at all saying the same thing. But how much obedience should be there? It says, as unto the Lord. Now, just for, you know, uh, uh, um, you know uh, giggles, if you will, I'll leave the other part of that phrase out. I looked up, and I like to do this from time to time. That took a second, didn't it? I, I like to do this from time to time where I'll get on the computer, and I'll do this just personally, and I don't preach it half the time, you know. But if I'm studying a subject, I like to see, like, I already know that there's the liberal Christians out there. And I know that they're going to try to justify these super clear statements and try to, you know, justify their disobedience and how that they are, you know, uh, uh, you know not keeping this commandment. So I just typed in, you know, you know, interpreting, you know, uh, Ephesians, you know, 5 verse, what is it, 22? Is that what it is? Verse 22. And I typed it in, interpreting Ephesians 5, 22. And like, focus on the family, I believe, is one that came up. And, you know, I, I read through a, a, a bunch of them, but what all of them tried to do was to basically speak out of both sides of the mouth. Every single time they would make a statement, and I believe this was focus on the family, worded it this way. They said this, they said, yes, Wives are supposed to submit unto their own husbands. But that does not mean that a husband controls every aspect or every area of life for the woman. Now, I don't know if you realize what they're trying to do. But what they're trying to do is, number one, they're trying to pretend or act like there are certain areas of life. Let me word it this way. They're trying to act like there are certain areas of life wherein the man does not have control over the wife. But number two, the, the, and I just made that error falling into their trap, they wanted to use the word control there, right? To try to make it seem as if what? Also again that it's misogynistic. Now, if you in your life, you know, in your marriage, let me say that, if you in your marriage have to control every area of your wife's life, there's probably an issue there. You're either a serious control freak or you, you know, maybe have some kind of marital problems where you feel like you have to move to that excess. Now, do you, do you reign over? Do you have the authority over every area of your wife's life? Yes. There is no area of my wife's life that I cannot stop and say, you're not doing that that way. Amen. Why? Because there's no area over my life that God cannot stop and say, you're not doing that that way. Read it one more time. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now watch this. As unto the Lord. How much should a wife, should a woman, a Christian lady be submitting unto the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there any area of a woman's life that she is not in subjection to the Lord? None. No area, period. That is in there for a reason, my friend. It's to tell you that you are in the, the same level of submission to your husband, ladies that is, to your husband as you are to the Lord. There is no area of my wife's life where she can just do whatever she wants. I am there as her husband to be the boss of our relationship, to be the boss of my life, her life, and our family's life. That is the job of 
the man. He is to be the head of the household. Now, of course, we give our wives freedom. You know, I don't reign over every area of my, of my, life's, my wife's life because I don't need to, right? So that's why they kind of polarize like there's these opposite, these two opposite choices. You shouldn't need to do that where every single decision, you're just like, no, you're not doing that. You're not wearing that. I don't like that outfit. You know, you need to put on, this is an outfit I think looks better on you. Obviously, you shouldn't need to do that. There shouldn't, you shouldn't need to like make every decision for your wife. Obviously, that would be strange. That would be weird if you were doing that. But could you do that? I want you to understand this. You could do that. According to the Lord, you could do that. That's how much uh, authority that the man has in the home. This is important to understand. It's complete obedience. It's just like this. Just like for children. It's the exact same thing. See, people, this may offend people, but it, it's not that women are being likened unto children, but it's the same level of obedience or the same uh, uh, spectrum of authority. This, I have the same amount of authority over my children that I have over my wife. There's no difference. The level of authority. Obviously, is there a major difference in our relationship? Of course. Major. But as far as the amount of authority that I have over my children is the exact same amount of authority that I have over my wife. There's no difference. Complete authority. 100% over my uh, authority over my wife and it's the exact same as my children. There's no, and that should help you kind of grasp and understand this concept a little bit better. Um, you know, furthermore, I want to make this point as well. I want you to notice in both passages, both passages, it makes the statement, wives, it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Notice it's your own husband. See, you know, uh, everyone else's wife is, does not need to submit to everyone else's husband, right? You know, a woman only, only is required to submit and obey her own husband. So there is this kind of patriarchal attitude that people can get sometimes where they start to think that all women you know, are supposed to submit to any command that any man gives you. And that is not taught biblically at all anywhere. You know, that is not a biblical concept. That is, you know, obviously men are meant to be in positions of leadership and women are not meant to be in positions of leadership. But that doesn't mean that men walk around just telling all women what to do. That's bizarre. That's weird. And there are people that will teach and kind of start to get this type of mentality and this attitude. I've heard people make strange statements that would, you know, uh, kind of be along those lines before. Women are not required to obey any other man outside of their own husband. Right. That's it. That's the only man that they're required to obey. That is it. So that's also uh, another little tip that we need to you know, uh, understand here in verse number 22. Verse number 23 says this. We'll go further now. Verse number 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now that's obviously building off of that statement that says, as unto the Lord. So there's a picture here of the wife being the church and the man being Christ. There's a picture here of how Christ is the head of the church, right? And Christ is the Savior of the body. And then you have the man and you have the woman. Look at verse number uh, 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands. Now watch this. In everything. So notice that statement that Focus on the Family made. What were they, in, what were they implying? He doesn't, have, he doesn't control every area of her life. What does that mean? That means there are certain areas where he doesn't have authority. You might want to use the word control to try to make it sound like if he could have authority in that area that he's controlling. That's what they're trying to do. They try to make, use words like that, you know, that have, carry bad connotations. But what does the Bible teach? That he rules over every area of her life. That is what the Bible teaches. I don't care what people think. Not even slightly. I don't care if people think that I'm some misogynistic, you know, bigoted jerk. It doesn't matter to me. I believe the Bible. That's what it comes down to. If I can quote you a verse and my philosophy and my beliefs line up with what this verse is saying, then, you know what, I don't give a rip what you say. I don't care what you think. This is what I'm worried about. I'm concerned about what the Bible teaches, what the Lord thinks about my beliefs. That's what matters. And I want to line up 
up with this book. Amen. That's what I want to line up with. The world's always changing. It's this issue today. It'll be another issue tomorrow. And like I said, you know, they're far from an ideal example of you know, a biblical or not even biblical successful marriages. That's the last thing I want to pattern myself after is the marriage council of this world. You know, then that's what the, the, the world will teach is what? Well, how should relationships operate when it comes to choices? 50-50. 50-50. Number one, that doesn't exist. No one's 50-50. No relationship is 50-50. Do you know why? Because no one agrees on everything. Not one single person agrees on, not, not one single relationship of man and woman agree on every single thing. So there's going to be a point in that relationship where a, a, a serious you know, uh, um, trial is going to occur, where a decision has to be made. And you know what's going to happen is husband and wife are going to disagree. Husband's going to say one thing, wife is going to say another thing. And they've had this covenant between one another that, hey, we're 50-50. But do you know what's going to find out? You know, you know what one of them is going to find out is we aren't 50-50. He was the boss all along. Or, you know, even more so today, she was the boss all along. That's what a lot of, you know, and you know what happens? Relationships don't survive. Relationships will not last. No relationship can truly be 50-50 because people do not agree on everything. It does not happen. It, it, it does not work. You know, in, in reality, there has to be one person that's making decision. Or it will come to a complete and absolute disaster. That's God's, God's system of authority is always the same. For the church, there's always a head of the heads. You know, there's a, there's a chief of the chiefs when it comes to the priests. In every single situation, in the congregation, there's a man set over the congregation. Of the judges, the judges are at the top. There's men under them. There's this structural system where it drops down. But at the very top, there has to be one person where it stops with. The buck has to stop somewhere, and they have to make the decision in the hard time. When a real trivial issue arises, there has to be somebody who says, this is what we're doing. There has to be. If there is going, if there is an institution, like I said, that has goals, that has you know certain uh, uh, projects that they're they're striving to achieve, there has to be someone that's saying this is what we're going to do, or it will be a complete nightmare. Can you imagine a ship, you know, out in the ocean, and there are decisions that need to be made, but there's like five people, six people there that all think they all have the same amount of authority, and then all of a sudden there's just this massive you know, catastrophic event. And then all six people, they all think you're, they're on the same level. I mean, this is life or death. And somebody's got to pull the trigger here on what they're going to do or they're all going to die. And then they're all just bickering back and forth. No one is foolish enough to design a system like that. Go to McDonald's and they understand, hey, let me see your boss. And they'll bring somebody else out. And then you know what else you can say? Let me see your boss. And then they'll bring somebody else out. And then ultimately, at the top, there will be one man that's making all the decisions. One man. Even when there's you know, uh, multiple owners and things like that, one of them normally is the boss. You know, If you look at a situation at my company, there's two brothers that started the company, but there's one guy. I'm not, I'm not going to choose between you guys which one's the boss here. You guys fight that out. But there's one guy who's the boss. There's one guy that has to ultimately make the decisions. That, that is how it has to be. There's one guy at my, at my company who is the main boss. He's the brother that is the main boss. They both started it together all at the same time, but the one brother knows he makes the decisions ultimately. When it comes down to it, somebody's got to make the decisions. He has to. Somebody, you know, so if... if there is going to be a successful institution, there has to be somebody at the top. There has to be somebody where the buck ultimately stops here. Marriage is not different. Marriage is exactly the same and the man and, or the person that is put and plugged into that position or into that office is the husband. He is the one. And wives are asked to submit. Wives are not only asked or requested, they are commanded to submit unto their husbands. Now how much submission? Full submission. The exact same amount that a child would have to their, um, you know, father or mother. That is the, it is the exact same amount. How much? As unto the Lord. They're both told the same statement, that children should obey their parents in the Lord. What does that mean? They're, how, they're obeying them in the Lord. That means that it's, it's by proxy, right? Whatever they're commanded, it's like they're doing it to the Lord. That's the point, right? That's what the servants are told. Whatever their, you know, their master gives them a request, it's they're, they're obeying, the, obeying their master 
in the Lord or to the Lord, right? As they're doing it to the Lord. They obey their masters. I want you to go with me to 1 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3. We'll see this again here. 1 Peter chapter number 3 verse number 1. <clears throat> if you are going to have a successful marriage, the husband has to be the leader. He has to be the leader and the wife, more importantly tonight, the wife has to um, resolve it in her heart. She has to be resolved that she is going to submit, that she is going to obey her husband. She's going to obey him in the Lord. I want you to look at me here at 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 1. The Bible says this, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Notice here it uses the word uh, subjection as opposed to it was using the word submit before. You know it's the same word, it's just talking about obeying. And then here it also gives you an example and it also uses that same statement as well. That's, that's very important. Subjection to your own husbands. So three times we see that same phrase and it's, all, it's every time very specific that it's your own husband. Not to just everybody else's husband. You are commanded to obey your own husband. Uh, and then it's, it goes on to say that this could be an example, your you know, chaste behavior could be an example to a husband that maybe is not saved. Maybe your husband is not saved and your life, conversation there means life, your, your godly life of being in obedience to him could be an example, could be an example to him, a good example of how a Christian should behave and then that may make him interested, you may be able to win him over with the gospel someday by living a good godly life. This is why our, our, our testimony is very important. Our testimony, our testimony alone will not win someone to Christ, but a bad toast testimony could push some away, someone away from Christ. So that's important to keep in mind. Look at verse number two. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. Now, of course, this is obviously something that women struggle with. They struggle with having, you know, uh, uh, this, this, this high importance on beauty. Obviously, all women feel this way, where they're always concerned about their looks. And the Bible is a deep book. And, it, and what it does is like Hebrews chapter number 4 verse number 12 says, is that it gets into the heart and it speaks to the heart. It knows the things naturally that you struggle with, that men struggle with, that women struggle with, and it will hit on those things. There are certain aspects that men struggle with. Things like pride, right? Being humble. This is, these are things that men will struggle with. Well, there are things that women struggle with as well. And one of the things is becoming infatuated with you know, their, the, the outward adorning, with their hair, with how they look, with beauty, right? With trying to be found beautiful. And the Bible over and over again tries to tell us that that's, explains to us that that is not important. So it says, let not the, the adorning be, it says, that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on apparel. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. So you know what that means? The, the plating of, of hair and the uh, outward adorning and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, that's corruptible. That's what that is. That's corruptible. There's going to be a day when you don't have your beauty anymore. There's going to be a day when you wake up and, and you know, and ladies aren't going to be able to you know, cover up their age. There's going to be a day when that takes place. And it shows you really and truly the value of that. Or the, the, the worth of, you know, the, you know, as it is worded here, wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, right? All of these different things. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. That's what's important. What is truly important to God is the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. So when God looks down, what He really sees value in, that's exactly what it's talking about, it's, it's in the sight of God of great price. 
What he really sees worth in or what he really sees value in is the hidden man of the heart, the character of the woman. You know, the meekness, the ability to be obedient, the ability to be able to put herself in subjection to her husband. Obviously, that's difficult. It's difficult to submit to anyone to some degree. Obviously, all of us, even, even our bosses at work, who here doesn't struggle at all submitting to your boss at work? Of course, there are times when it's a struggle to be, to be in submission, right? Well, just like for men, there is no difference. It's difficult for women as well to be in submission to their own husbands. And when God looks down and he sees you trying, trying in your life in this area, he sees you, you know, uh, uh, you know, putting forth your best effort, going through day by day and being meek, being quiet, being obedient, your husband telling you what to do. And even though in spite of wanting to do something different or thinking you should do something different, you go along and you do what your husband has told you you're going to do, God looks down and says that it's of great price. And in context, it's important to understand that that's being contrasted with what women struggle with oftentimes of being concerned with and, and, and very much overly concerned with their looks. And he's saying, what it's saying is this, your looks means nothing to God. God does not care. God is, God is the one that you should be worried about his opinion. And he is not worried about that. He is not concerned about that. It's saying that that's vanity, that's meaningless, but what actually has a great price is when you're in, you're in obedience, you're in submission, you're in subjection to your own husbands. You're able to obey your husbands. And especially in the situation where maybe it's harder. Obviously, it's difficult in every situation to a degree, but when you think, you know, that maybe your husband's making a bad decision, it would be a lot more difficult to do what he wants you to do, wouldn't it? God looks down and when he sees that taking place, he says that that's a great price. That's of value to God. That's of worth to God. It pleases God when he looks down and he sees a woman being in obedience and being in subjection. Look at verse 5. It says this, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorn themselves. So they adorn themselves. Now let's see what they adorn themselves with. Being in subjection unto their own husband. So oftentimes what do women do? What is it speaking of there? They'll put on gold. They'll put on costly apparel. They'll put on silver. But it says, you know what? The holy women also, they, in times past, they adorned themselves also. But it wasn't with gold. It wasn't with silver. It wasn't with costly apparel. Do you know what they adorned themselves with? Being in subjection to their own husbands. Being in submission to their own husbands. Obeying their own husbands. Being obedient to their own husbands. God looks down... And to him, that is actually of great price. That's of great worth. Not the gold, not the silver, not the looks, not the beauty. That's not what he's concerned about. And he's the one that matters. He's the one whose opinion we should be concerned about and worried about. And he says that that's actually what's of worth to me. That's what I care about. Look at what it says next. <clears throat> Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and, not, and are not afraid with any amazement. So it uses Sarah as an example there. And it's using an example of being obedient and furthermore, an example of something that God specifically is of great price, believes is of great price. To him it is something of great price. Of what? Of great value. Now what did she call him? It says calling him Lord, right? Now we would not call someone Lord today. That would be, you know, pretty odd if someone called someone else Lord. That word is not in our vocabulary today. But the word Lord just means sir. That's all that the word Lord means. It is, it is the word, uh, you know, the, a modern day word we would use as sir. When people said Lord in 1611, it was a respectful way to refer to someone that was an authority. That's all that it was. And the modern word today would be sir. Now, I want you to notice, and this is super important, that every single sermon that I've preached, there, there are the same principles in every single one of them. Every single one of them. You know, you need to submit unto your, your boss. You need to do it because God said so. God is above that person, right? All of these, you remember all of these ingrained in each, in each uh, individual one? If, if you know, they tell you to do something that the Lord tells you not to do, then you obey the Lord, right? Uh, it's, it's legitimate authority because God instituted it. I mean, every single sermon all has the same points. Every single one of them. And one of the points that I talked about that was good to respond and speak to your boss was what was one of the phrases? You should refer to him as sir. I refer to my bosses as sir. You should do that. Children, well, how should they refer to their bosses? 
Are there, which would be their parents, of course. How should they refer to their bosses? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. That's what my children do all the time. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. It's the exact same thing. The, the, the way that the authority works is not any different. I believe, now people may think this is radical or weird, but if you're around my family a lot, you'll notice that my wife refers to me as sir. She says, yes, sir. That's not just here. When we're at home and I tell my wife something and I say, hey, do this, do that, do that, she'll say, yes, sir. She does it all the time. That is in the Lord's eyes a great price. When, when, when Sarah said Lord to Abraham, that is used as an example in this exact context of being of great price. That demonstrates obedience. It's an outward show of obedience. Furthermore, it's an outward show of what's in the heart. And that's what I was going to quote. Furthermore, you know, the Bible teaches that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And this was the other point that was a common thread throughout all of those sermons. Children should not just be going through the emotions. They should be obeying their parents from the heart. You, as servants at work, also, if you remember this point, you should not just be going through the motions. You should be truly in obedience to your master. You should be truly in obedience to your boss. I don't know if you remember that point, but I preach that as well. In all authorities, we should be doing it from the heart. It should be on the inside, right? We should truly be saying what is on the inside, right? Now, this passage, I don't know if you're familiar with where this is taken from. But where this, is actu where this actually comes from is when uh, the Lord, and it's Jesus, of course, in an appearance in the Old Testament, He shows up to Abraham and Sarah. And He's talking about how they are going to be uh, you know, having a child, right? You know, they're going to be having Isaac. Now, they're, they're of age, right? This was the second time He came to them, and they're of age. And she, Sarah responds in, in her heart. She's not even speaking out loud. She actually responds and says something to what, to what Jesus had said to Abraham. And she's in the tent and she hears them speaking. And then she speaks within herself. She actually says something within herself or within her heart. And she says, you know, shall, you know, shall I have pleasure and my Lord also? Something along those lines. You know, having a child in such an old age is what she's referring to. And you know what she called Abraham in her heart? Lord. Sarah was not going through the motions. In her mind, <clears throat> she had a real serious respect for her husband. And when she thought of her husband, that was her Lord. That was her Sir. That was her Master. That's how she viewed her husband. This is, in all areas of our life, authorities in our lives, this is how we should be. This is how you should be for your boss. This is how children should be for their parents. And this is how women should be for their husbands. They should have a legitimate view of their husband being their boss. And they should have a real true respect. And I believe that it's good. And if maybe you struggle with that, then it's good to just start putting this into practice. If you start speaking it and saying it, then it will help you to grow that true sincere respect for your husband within your heart. I think it's good to, you know, uh, if you're struggling with it, to, to, to start putting it on your lips. I think that will help you a little bit to grow in respect. But either way, it's of good price. You say, why should I do it? Because God likes it. Because God views it well. Because God thinks it's good. That's why. This is an exact example. You say, I think that's silly. It's an example of something that is of great price to God. He says that that's good. I like that. I view that like gold and silver. I think that that's a good thing and I'm pleased when a woman says sir to her husband. It's the exact same thing. The equivalent today would be sir as opposed to the word Lord. And, and you know, like I said, people may, I'm sure, especially the feminazis and all of that, they'd be like, oh my gosh, I don't care. God likes it. I don't care what you think, you butch dyke. You know, I'm serious. That's how all of them are all the same. You know, I care what God thinks. The last people that I care about are the stinking nasty world, man. They're, you know, I don't care about their opinion. We need to care about what God thinks. Amen. That's what this is explaining. We need to get away from being concerned about what the world thinks about things, right? It's saying that, hey, stop thinking about what people you care about about the outside. Care about what God thinks about on the inside. God's the only one that knows the heart. Care about what God thinks when he looks at you. Care about what God cares about. And you know what God cares about? God cares about the, the inner man. He cares about, you know, character, virtue, things like that. And we have, we're given an example. If you're, you don't think, I'm sure no one in here would say, hey, I'm sure everyone, let me say this, let me say this, uh, point number one. Everyone would agree that, hey, we want to please God. We want to please God, right? What would be the next question? 
Lord, what can I do to please you? Now, what could be any better than him giving you an actual example of what someone did and then said, this is what pleased me? That's like exactly what you would want. That's like precise and specific to, here's an actual example. You couldn't have anything better. You know, it, would be, it would even be more difficult if he's just like, be obedient. Be obedient, right? But he's like, hey, let me give you an example of when someone was obedient and it pleased me. So if you want to please God, ladies, here's a great start. Here's a great start, women, that are wanting to please God. Say sir to your husbands. And this, and you know what it is? That comes from a heart, a true heart of obedience. That's what it is. It comes from that inner man of a true heart of obedience. And you can see that that's on the inside of Sarah. You can see that she was truly obedient and she respected her husband. I want you to turn with me uh, now to Galatians chapter number 3, verse number 28. Now people will say, well, does that mean that women are of less value or of less worth because they have to submit to them? No one in here would make the argument... No one in here would make the argument that an employee at McDonald's that's running the fryer is of less value because they're running the fryer and they're not the manager. Value as in their worth of life, right? Like his value of life is more than his. No one would make that argument, right? Everyone understands that authorities are needed. Authorities are needed. Leadership is needed. Now, it would be equivalent to someone saying, well, that guy working the fryer shouldn't be obedient to that manager. Or I don't think that there should be any system of structure of, of, of authority. It should just be 50-50. And if you said no, you know, he needs to make the decisions and he needs to run the fryer, their response would be, what, what are you saying, that he's of less worth? That is the identical argument. It's not any different at all. That's how silly and stupid it is. I'm just giving you an example of how dumb it is. Furthermore, here's another example. Who would say, because children need to obey their parents, who would try to argue, are you saying that children aren't of the same value and worth? Their life is not of the same value and worth as their parents? That's how dumb and stupid that argument is. It is retarded. It is ridiculous. It is two totally different subjects. A person that is an authority is a t has nothing to do with their value or worth of life. They have two different purposes. They have two different jobs. They, they, you know, their office of life is different. We don't all do the same things. I mean, this is just, this should be simple. And, and I'm going to give you a perfect example here. Galatians 3.28 is actually what this verse is about. It says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek. Now, what did the Jews think about their race? They were superior to the Greek. Look, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Watch this. There is neither bond nor free. Now, if you had to pick about a person that's bond or free, if you had to pick about a person that's a master or a servant, who would you say superior or inferior? That's the exact example I just gave you a moment ago. A worker or a boss, right? Of course, you'd say the boss is more superior in the sense of the authority, right? Then it says this, There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So what is it saying? It's giving you examples of life where we can see that there is, you know, obviously where the Jew and the Greek, they have certain benefits or advantages that were given to them. But were they better? Were they just better just based upon their race in God's eyes? Did their life have more value than a Greek? Of course not. Does a person that's free have greater value than a person that is a servant or that is a bond servant? Is their life worse let, worth less? Is a person that is working for, for another man, is their life worth less than another person's? Or is a child's life worth less than an adult's? That's silly. And what does the Bible say? It says, there is neither male nor female. And then he goes on to say, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You know what matters? Whether you're in Christ. That's what matters, whether you are in Christ. Male nor female, it doesn't matter. That's the point. That God cares about both. It's, it's ridiculous. Being, <clears throat> being the boss does not make you uh, of more value. It just makes you the one that's making the decisions. That's it. You just have a different job. You have a different office. Both people have the same value of life and the same worth in God's eyes. It's a silly, stupid argument. It, it's, it's, it just shows... A lot, it just shows a logical fallacy on the part of you know, the person projecting their opinion here. That's what they see here. Or that's what you see. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 3. 
1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 3, we're going to see this again, where it talks about the man being uh, the head of the woman. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. So notice that there is a structure there, isn't there? There is a, an authority chain or an authority structure that is set up here. And we can see that the man is the head of the woman. He is the head of the woman. Look down at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 7. It says this, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Now that means from. Now verse 9. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 18. Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 18. Now God obviously knew the beginning from the ending. and When he created man, he already planned on creating woman. He made a mate for all of the, the animals uh, instantly, right? But he waited to create woman. And the reason was because of the authority chain. That was the purpose. That was explained to us just a moment ago. It, every time that this is mentioned and it talks about the man being created first, it tells you that it's because he's the boss. Every single time. Here's another example. 1 Timothy 2.12 But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. So notice, what was that? What, was, what did he appeal to? He appealed to the fact that the man was created first, that he came first. That's not of more value, of more worth. That has nothing to do with that. That was done purposely to set up an authority chain. Every time that the, the uh, order of man and woman being created is mentioned, it always appeals to the fact that he's the authority. Every single time. Now, of course, the authority uh, is the one who makes the, the, the calls, right? He makes the decisions. He's the one that says, hey, this is what we're doing. So what would the other person do? What would they be? If, they, if this guy said, hey, this is what we're doing. So at my, at my job, you know, I'm the boss basically on site. You know, I'm the, the on-site supervisor. I'm the foreman. And I say, this is what we're doing. Do you know what the guy that's with me is called? My helper. That's what he's called. That is his, you know, this is my helper for the day. He's my helper. Hey, you're going to have so-and-so as your helper that day. And they'll switch people out, right? The, you know, so God created the man first. He's the boss. He's the authority, and then the woman was created after him to be his helper. To be his helper. Man makes the decisions. Man decides what they're going to be doing in their lives and their families in, in all areas. While the Is that locked and you can't get in or something? Yeah. It's in my uh, drawer where, where I put my mic, if you know where that's at. My keys are in there too. Um, but yeah, so I'm getting ready to do the drawer again. I don't know why my mind's all jacked up. So yeah, the man was created first, right? To set up the authority. That is the purpose. That's proven by the fact that both times when it's mentioned, it appeals to him being the authority. She's created next because she is to be the help of the man. This again would burn women's biscuits today. But this is what the Bible teaches. This is what the Bible teaches. Women are there to be the helper of the man. He makes the decisions and that's what women do. They're there to help the man and they're there to be there as a help. And it says meet for him. That is a help fit for him. Uh, go to Genesis 2. That's where you turn, correct? Genesis 2, look at verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make... Him and help meet for him. That means fit for him. It's not like help mate. A lot of people will be confused about the way that that's worded. And then it goes on to talk about how he creates all of the animals, but for him it says, you know, uh, but for Adam there was not found in help meet for him. So none of those were fit for him, of course. That's the point. Look, verse number 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead. That means in place. Instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. That's actually what the word woman means. The, the W-O means out of or from, right? Man, obviously, there is just the word man. So it's saying out of Man. She was taken out of man. Verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, 
and they shall be one flesh. So man shall leave his father and mother and they shall cleave to one another because woman was taken out of man. So they become that one flesh again like they were previously. That's what that's supposed to be symbolic of. So we can see there that man was created first, then woman. And let me say this. There are physical, you know, uh, anatomical, you know, mental, biological, inherent differences between men and women. Major. We are not alike at all in so many different ways. So many, yes, Woman was taken out of man, but we're not the same. Men are created with a lot of leadership qualities. And this is really important to understand, a lot of leadership qualities. Women are known to be very undecisive. In all areas of life, they look around. That's why it's the, you know, the, the stereotype of women spending a lot of time in stores. Why are they in there? Of course, they love to shop and stuff, but they look at 50 different dresses. They look at, you know, every color of whatever product that it is and then they're like, oh, I love this one. Oh, but now this one. Right? When we walk up to buy food, my wife does it constantly. All the time. She's like, oh, I'm in the mood for that. Oh, but I'm in the mood for that. I'll be like, ah, okay, uh, this is what we want and I'll order for us. You know, that's how women are. They're very, very undecisive. That is not a leadership quality. It is, you cannot be undecisive in a position of leadership, right? You have to be a decisive person. So men need to make sure that they are decisive. Men need to make, they need to be the type of person that just, you know, knows when and how to pull the trigger when it needs to be done. They need to be able to make a decision when a decision needs to be made. And men inherently have that ability. Now, you know, uh, the world tries to stifle your masculinity. The, you know, our modern culture today tries to make men not men, right? I'm so thankful that I grew up in an area and a family and stuff where, you know, the men are men. You know, you go, you go to certain areas like Tempe, Arizona is a perfect example of that. And right when I got there, I thought that there were just faggots everywhere. But I came to find out that these are not faggots. They're just very feminine men. I'm not kidding you. We got there and we started walking around and everyone looked queer. Now, you may not remember that right when you got there. or Maybe it's just a bigger difference. But when I got there, I'm like, man, there are, everyone is a homosexual. You know, but that wasn't it. It's just everybody wore skinny jeans and everybody dressed feminine, right? In the area where I'm from, people, the men are more masculine, you know, than that particular area. And I believe that's probably a West, more of a West thing because uh, obviously they're close to California. They have some of the influences of that. But the world in general today is trying to stifle masculinity. But inherently, deep down, there's a masculine man with the leadership qualities. And men, I've been preaching to the women mostly to this, but it's important for men to, to uh, you know, step up and to take that role that God has given to you. And you need to, you need to you know, be able to take the bull by the horns and be the man in the relationship. Women do not like undecisive men. You know, uh, women do not like men that are not masculine. Men that they feel like cannot you know, protect them. You know, they want a man. Men and women are created differently. And what actually causes men and women to be attracted to one another is the differences. That's what causes the attraction. And I'm sure everyone that everyone in here on either side of the coin can both identify with this. The more similar that the opposite sex is, the less attractive they are. The, 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 the more different that they are, the more, you know, uh, uh, the stronger that the qualities are of feminism. If you are very masculine, the more feminine they are, the more attractive that a woman would be. I'm sure both sides agree with this, right? The opposition of our genders is what causes men and women to be attractive. So the things that a woman would find attractive are all the things that men were born with. You need to you know, uh, harness and, and, and embrace those qualities. You need to be a man. Men need to be men today. And we need in our church, and all the men in our church need to make sure that you are raising your men you to be men. Your boys to be men. That's what you need to do. All the boys in your family they need to grow up to be men. Real men. They need to grow up to be strong leaders where you know, when they, they, they can marry a wife and they can lead and make good decisions for a family. They're not scared when they get behind the wheel. They're ready to make decisions. They're ready to lead a woman in life. That's the type of boys that we need to be coming out of our church. I want to have a bunch of men in this church when they get older. I want to have a bunch of strong men that aren't these feminine sissies that are afraid maybe to tell somebody what they need to tell them, afraid to go somewhere. We need to have strong men. We need to be raising strong men. That's what we need to be raising. Now, <clears throat> there are major differences 
between men and women on both sides of the coin were not the same. We're not even close to being the same and that's, as I said, that's what actually causes or brings about the attraction. Let me have you turn to the very last place. I want to go back to uh, Colossians, I believe it's, no, let's go back to Ephesians 5. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter number 5. <clears throat> One of the things is the physical difference. That's why I wanted to hit on. Men and women are not physically the same. This is also shows that the man is to be the leader. The, the men and women are not physically the same. Men are stronger. Right. You know, there's this kid that, uh, it's the kid that I just destroyed in one-on-one, -on -one, right? His name's Kenji. You know, I had to, he tried to bring that up the other day and tried to give me some excuse. I'll shut up. I don't want to have any excuses. I mopped the floor with you. But he, the other day he was telling me about his, his, his physical ed class and how they're like, they, they're like removing all of the barriers between the, the boys and the girls. And they're all just like running together, racing together. They don't have like the women's. This is in college. This is UNF. They don't have like, in just in the physical education class. Uh, they don't have in his particular class, maybe it's just his teacher. Because now the teacher has liberty to do whatever they want. They don't do things separately anymore. He's like, they did right when I started. He's like, but they changed that now. He's like, it's, it's, we all just have the same goal that we're shooting for, nothing is different. Men and women are not the same. Physically, we are not even close to being the same. I'm sure that the military still has a different uh, standard for, for men and women to get in, right? I know they talked about trying to change that. They do still, right? Yeah, there's, there's a reason why. There's a reason why. That's because men are stronger. Men are bigger. Men, they're just built you, it, we are built entirely different. You know, Bruce Jenner can have as many stinking operations as he wants, and it just makes him look like a bigger monster. He's walking around with like a, 12, tw uh, like a size 12 shoe. He looks like a monster. He's, you're, all, you're still going to be Bruce, buddy. There's nothing you can do. You can shave that Adam's apple off. You look like a man. His shoulders are just as, you know, wider than mine. I mean, the guy is he's just disgusting looking. There's nothing you can do about it. Men and women are different. And that's, and that's, that is, you know, people really try to argue this. We're all the same. That's a major point right there. Why do you need to go through all these operations? If we're all the same, even outside of, you know, our, our, our male and female anatomy, why go through all these other operations? Because there's a major, major difference. The face structure, look at the jaws of a man. Look at the jawline of a man, right? There are so many differences. You know, there are, there are certain characteristics that are masculine characteristics that tend towards the man side of the gene, like big noses. It's rare that you, I have a monster of a nose. It's rare that you see females with big noses. That's just the truth. You don't see women with big noses a lot because certain characteristics lean towards men more and certain characteristics lean toward women have smaller noses. Women have smaller features in every area of their life, in every, or every part of their body. They're just smaller. They have smaller feet, hands, just in general. These are all, why? Because men were designed bigger, stronger, faster, more athletic. That's an area of life where men are better because they're meant to be there to protect the women. The man's job is to protect his wife. Men need to be able to protect their wives. Men need to be strong enough to be able to protect their wives. You know, these are all dif these are differences between men and women. Why? Because the man is to be the leader. If your wife was getting up to protect you in the middle of the night, that just shows that you're not the leader in the, in the relationship. I remember there was specifically a, a family where this woman said that she, if somebody broke in in the middle of the night and he even like, he didn't concede but he just didn't say anything, that she was probably, she probably would be the one that got up. That's obviously an area of life where, where the leader would be stepping into his role, right? right. The leader of the family. Right. It's the same thing with being a provider. Men need to be the provider of the home. Why? Because that's what the leader does. He takes care of the home. He watches over the home. He's the watchman of the home. He watches after the home. He, he you know, watches over the spirituality. You need to be... The, the spiritual watchman of your household. You need to be the physical watchman, you know, and even if, you know, one of those alarms fall off, you jump up physically, but also you need to be a spiritual watchman. You know, if any alarms go off, you know, even if it's a false alarm, you need to be ready to fix the problem, maybe with one of your children. If they're confused about something, uh, uh, biblically, you need to step in, right? 
of course, the, you know, a lot of these areas, the women need to be doing the same thing too, right? It's kind of like this. Who is the primary teacher of the children? The wife, right? Of course, the women. She's there with them. She teaches them primarily. That's why the women are mentioned more, even more so in the book of Proverbs when it talks about teaching the children, teaching the son. But both are mentioned. That doesn't mean that you're totally negated. You still oversee that. And that's important to understand. The man should oversee and manage every area in the home. Did you hear what I said? The man should oversee and manage every single area. Finances, everything. Everything. Now, de can you delegate stuff? Of course. But if you step in and say, I don't like how you're doing that. We're not doing it that way. That's your decision. And you know what the wife should do? She should say, yes, sir. Amen. That's what the wife should do. That, now, if you think it's a bad decision, it doesn't matter. That's your job. The wife is supposed to submit it. That's when it's the heart. Everybody will go along and be obedient when it's easy. You know what? It, you, you, when you're going to find out when the rubber meets the road is when it's difficult, right? It's easy to tell the truth or to be honest when you're not being tested by anything, right? But when you're tested, that's when people will tend to lie about things. So that's when you'll stand up and actually do the right thing. So when, when you're tried in a situation, that's when you're really going to come out like gold. That's when you're really going to get rewards from the Lord. When you're tried. That's when you know, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, make, you'll please the Lord when you're in a situation like that, in a crunch situation like that. Did you guys turn to Ephesians 5? <clears throat> so I want to look at Ephesians 5, and this is the point that I, I want to end on. Now, <clears throat> just a couple of quick statements as well. I'm going to try to wrap this up. You know, I don't believe that women should be criticizing their husbands. Because we're different, lady, we're different men and women, that is. You know, uh, there are certain things, and this is true. Uh, you, know, you guys have heard this before, those that attended church in Arizona. And this is very true. There are things that bother men. There are things that bother women. There are things that men desire, and there are things that women desire. Because men were created to be leaders and to be the boss and to run things. They desire admiration in that area more so. You know, women, they desire to be loved and to be cared after, right? So we need to take these things into account. And, you know, women don't need to be attack attacking their, their husband's masculinity. They don't need to be getting in there and, 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 and trying to criticize their husband in areas of maybe leadership. If your husband makes a bad decision or if your husband is lacking in a certain area, it's not your job to correct him. I don't believe that it's right for a woman to go to her husband and try to correct her husband in areas like that. You know, so I think that that's a that can be a major problem in a marriage is when the woman, when the, 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 the wife goes to the husband and, and is criticizing or correcting. Because that 1 Peter 3 gives you an example of a family where the wife is saved, the husband's not. Does it sound like he's doing what he's supposed to be doing? Of course not. What is the advice that's given to her? Just keep doing your job. Just do what you're supposed to be doing. Keep being a meek and quiet spirit. That's the philosophy of Christianity in that area. That's what's being taught to the, to the wife. You just need to do what you're doing. It's not your job. He's your boss. If you're, if you're, let me ask you this question. If your boss was jacking stuff up at the job, would you go to him and say, hey, you should be doing that that way? Of course not. Why? Because it's outside of your scope of responsibilities. It's outside of your authority. You're stepping out of your bounds. So I don't believe that it's right for a woman to do that. To go to, and I don't believe, even if he's trying his best, it's even worse. And you're sitting there criticizing him, that's something that would bother a man. Very much so. That's an area where a man would be annoyed. You know, and women, they more so desire to be loved, cared after, nurtured. They want, they want you to show them that you love them and care for them affectionately. Um, and then just these last two points right here quickly. These, these are points as examples. Wife, if you're trying to find out where's my, where's my area to be obedient, where should I be at, what should I do? You know, your husband is your boss. Just like how, you know, I have a boss at work or maybe probably the women that attend our church, I'm sure that they have probably worked a job at one point, right? And there was, there's an obedience as ex that is expected to your boss. It's the same. You should be obedient. Specifically here, it's in all things. You should be obedient in all things. And think about this. If you have exercised that obedience to a boss at work, but you won't do it to your husband, how does that make any sense? Shouldn't you love your husband? Even, you know, and obviously, you're not loving your boss. You should have a love for your husband. You should have a love for you know, uh, your family. 
that would build a stronger family unit. If you're being obedient, you're giving a good example to your, uh, you know, your children, especially daughters. So look at how a, a, a servant at work or an employee at work would be obedient to their employer. Maybe if you've done that before, I mean, you know, obviously I believe you should be going above and beyond that much more so. The family is something precious in the Bible. It's very important. It's of great price when a woman is, is obedient to her husband. And, of course, even more so because you love him. You should be obedient to him and submit unto him. And then, um, just a husband's last point. Husbands, you should have a self-sacrificing uh, self love for your wife. You should have a self-sacrificing love for your wife. You should not be abusing your power and your authority. You should be sacrificing yourself, just like Adam sacrificed himself for Eve, just like Christ sacrificed himself for his bride, the church. We should be sacrificing ourselves. We should not be going with what, what our desires are. We should put our own wants and desires aside. We should be choosing out what's best for the family and putting ourselves last. That's how we should be as husbands. That's true character as a man. Being a leader, being a leader and, and yes, making the decisions and doing what has to be done but you shouldn't be just, you know, just, just splurging yourself for yourself. And just everything that you get, you're just you know, uh, uh, pleasing yourself with it, filling your own belly. You should be putting your wife first. You should be putting your family first. And not doing just what's best for them and their preferences. That's not what I'm saying. You know, just giving her ice cream because she wants ice cream all the time. Obviously, that's ridiculous. Doing what's best for looking and saying and reading the Bible, what does my wife really need? The things that are of value and of worth, what does she need? Obviously, preference come into play sometimes. But giving her what really is needed. Giving your family what they really, truly need. And then putting yourself. Stay up a little later if you need to, to do something for yourself. Put your family first. That's a true leader. That's what it is. That is a true leader. It's putting your family first and sacrificing yourself. Put your wife first and sacrifice yourself. And so you're there in Ephesians 5, correct? Let me get there myself. And This needs to be from the heart. The, the obedience <clears throat> to husbands from wives needs to be from the heart. I want you to look here in Ephesians chapter number 5. <clears throat> it tells us here in Ephesians 5, you know what it was Colossians, I'm sorry. Flip over to Colossians, they're, they're nearby. So go to Colossians chapter number 3. You'll notice how all the authorities are spoken of all at the same time. Look at verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Notice how almost the exact same statements are given to each one. Obey in all things. Obey in all things. It's well-pleasing to God. Very similar statements given to each one, as it is fit in the Lord. Then it goes on to say this, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, watch this, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Now watch this. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So notice there that reward is mentioned, and then also it talks about serving serving the Lord, when you're being obedient to your master, and let's say this, when you're being obedient to, unto your husband, does it ultimately what are you doing? You're serving God. Now, what did we see with Sarah? Perfect example, and then we're going to end with this. We saw her being obedient from the heart. It was the inner man. It wasn't just the actions. It wasn't unto man, was it? It was from the heart. And what was it? It was of great price to God. Sarah's going to be rewarded for that. You may have a husband that's not doing even the right things. There's husbands out there that aren't the greatest husbands. And it even gives that in his example in 1 Peter 3. Even if your husband's not self-sacrificial. He's, he's selfish instead of being selfless like he should be. Right? You know, that doesn't give any wife a way out. You still need to obey your husbands. It's not like if he doesn't uphold his side of the deal then I'm not upholding mine. That's not a Christian attitude. You need to do what's right regardless of others. You need to do what's right regardless of your you know, uh, um, spouse. Right? Because why? Because this. This is important. You're going to receive a reward of the Lord. Because that is of great price to the Lord. You talked about gold and silver adorning yourself with that. God will ultimately give you a reward for that. That's why we need to be being obedient to the heart. In all areas of authority, we need to be obedient 
from the heart. We need to have Christian characteristics. This is going to be the, the, the ending. I thought about maybe preaching one on you know, uh, being obedient to your pastor because you guys need it. No, I'm just kidding. I thought about preaching one on you know, the obedience to the, ruler, the leadership or the rulers of the church, but I hit on that so much previously. So this is going to be, I'm you know, yes, making this decision right now like I do with the majority of my sermons. This is going to be the end of the series. And there's a couple of things I want to walk away with right now. So give me a couple of minutes to conclude right now because I'm making this up on the spot. Number one, okay, we need to recognize the God of gods, the Lord of lords, Amen. the King of kings, the authority above all. If any of those other authorities try to tell you anything different than what he says, nuts to them. The supremacy clause kicks in and you obey him and not them. That goes for husbands. If a husband tells a wife, you should not go to church. You should not read your Bible. You obey God as opposed to your husband. So he is the God of gods. He is the Lord of lords. We need to be obedient, yes, in action. And indeed, we also need to be obedient from the heart. We need to have true obedience, real true obedience from the heart. And how much obedience should we have? Let's say to government. Let's say to, uh, you know, uh, church rulership. How much obedience should a wife have to her husband? And there are different scopes of this, of course. I don't reign over your life, just throwing that in there right now, personally at home. But in those other areas, let's just leave that out. Those other areas of children to their parents, of wives to their husbands, of servants to their masters. Complete obedience. That's what's taught in all things. That's what it says about the servants in all things. It, same thing for children. Complete obedience, you know, and, and obviously that's at work and things like that. Complete obedience. 100% obedience, we should obey them as long as it does not contradict the law of the Lord. This is an important characteristic. Why I chose to preach on this is I want to have a lot of people that have the right heart in my church. Being a humble person. This is a thing that is, that is extremely lacking. And it's the most important quality, it seems, in the Bible. Pride will destroy your life. And people that struggle being obedient and submitting to authority... And all these people that are just these anarchists and they're, you know, they, they hate any form of government or people that always have problems with every church leader that they ever sit under, it's always because they're prideful and they don't have a humble heart. The, you know, that is so far from being a Christian characteristic. You know, it is so important, it is such an important virtue to be humble. Amen. That's why it's, it's, it's good to understand there are legitimate authorities. There are legitimate authorities that God has instituted. We need to obey them. Why? You obey them. Because he said so. That's your main reason. Obey them because the Lord said so. Don't just go through the motions. Obey them from the heart. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you, dear God, for being the God of gods, uh, the King of kings, dear Lord. We thank you for, for all of the authorities that you set up in our lives and for uh, just giving us the, the, uh, the correct system for success just in any area, just to get anything done and to be prosperous in any area of life uh, for just laying out all of that for us. We ask you that you would help us all to have humble hearts, help us to be obedient to our masters to help us to be obedient to all areas of life where we have authorities, to the government. Uh, uh, you know, we ask you that you would just give us the right heart in all of these areas, dear Lord, and be with us. Bless us, bless our church, help us have strong uh, Christian men and women in our church. We love you so much, and in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. <clears throat>